The historical monuments of India are the speaking jewels of India's ancient glory, the richness of its culture and the living embodiment of the brilliance of its artisans. Currently, India is home to 40 UNESCO World Heritage Sites which include 32 cultural, 7 natural and 1 mixed site. Apart from these world-renowned heritage sites, there are numerous other ancient sites and monuments that remind us of the marvels of our ancestors. Preservation of these treasures remains a matter of national and international importance and pride. To achieve this objective, the ancient monument and archaeological sites and remains act was passed by the parliament in 1958. As we celebrate with great pride and joy the journey of 75 years of our independence, Sunset TV has launched a unique series titled 75 Years Laws That Shaped India, deliberating various landmark laws that have been adopted during these golden years. I'm your host Heman Batra back with another episode in that series. In today's episode, we take up the ancient monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act 1958, a landmark law for the preservation of ancient and historical monuments and archaeological sites and remains of national importance, as well as for the regulation of archaeological excavations and for the protection of sculptures, carvings and other like objects. To discuss this milestone legislation, we have with us two distinguished guests in the studio. We have with us Bibek Deberoy, a globally renowned economist and author. Currently, he is chairman of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Bibek has authored more than 100 books in the diverse fields. He has translated Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Valmikis, Ramayana, the Bhagavad Purana and more into the English language. Welcome, Bibek. And we also have with us Aman Sinha, an eminent senior advocate in the Supreme Court. He's a distinguished arguing counsel, a celebrated author and columnist. Welcome, Thank Aman. Before commencing our discussion, it would be worthwhile to see a short audiovisual depiction of the journey of this law in the parliament. The ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains bill 1957 was introduced in Rajya Sabha on December 16, 1957 and passed in Lok Sabha on December 8, 1958 and Rajya Sabha on February 17, 1958. It received assent on August 28, 1958. So far as the national monuments are concerned, at present the national monuments are enumerated in three acts which have been passed. The Act of 1951, which I have mentioned, then the Amending Act of 1953, which by a curious combination of circumstances became Act 3 of 1954, and the Amending Act of 1956, which was Act 70 of 1956. These three acts give the entire list of national monuments and the archaeological sites. It is a good thing that government is now trying to make a serious effort for protecting our monuments and at the same time to look after all kinds of antiquarian objects including manuscripts, epigraphs and works of art or craftsmanship. We are glad that after all the government have taken some steps to fulfill up the lacuna in the preservation of our Asian monuments and records. This was not properly done during the regime of British government, not even during the last 10 or 11 years by our own national government. I have come to feel that the purpose of this bill is not consolidation but over centralization. I feel that this kind of approach is going to do a great deal of damage to our country, which abounds in monuments of all kinds and a country which cannot afford to do away with any kind of monument which the Ministry of Scientific Research and Cultural Affairs in its wisdom may consider to be of a national importance.
Vivek, let's move into uh, discussion now. And Aman, I'll come to you as well. Let me first start with you, Vivek. Vivek, this law, which we are discussing uh, in this episode, has been identified and, and considered as, as one of the landmark laws in the journey of uh, legis legislation and lawmaking uh, in the last 75 years. Now, in your words, how would you describe this law as so significant that it is considered as a landmark law? And, and also, uh, I may uh, like to ask another question which is attached to this, the first question, that how you think it is so significant in the modern era as well? Thank you, Mr. Batra. Let me congratulate Sansat TV and uh, you for having started this particular series on 75 laws Thank that you. shaped India. Thank you so much. And uh, let me also congratulate you for having chosen this particular piece of legislation, particularly because in the third week of November, we will celebrate globally or observe globally World Heritage Week from 19th to 25th of November. But I strongly disagree with identifying this as one of the laws that shaped sure. India in that list of 75. Let me explain why. 58 represented two things. Right. A, it is not the responsibility of citizens to do every, anything. It is the responsibility of the union government to do everything. Right. And that is reflected in this 1958 yeah, piece of legislation. Right. Conscious shift. Right. Oh, Article, I know the two of you are lawyers. I should not be talking about the Constitution. <laughs> Article 49, Directive Principles of State Policy, we have given the responsibility for the union government. End of story. Right. Secondly, as Mr. Sharma said, it represented centralization. Earlier, it used to be with DCs, which I think was a good thing. Right. Here, it's centralized. That's a good point you have made. And, and I'm sure as the discussion proceeds, you would also be suggesting, uh, you know, how we can evolve this law now so as to meet the growing challenges with regard to conservation and, and protection of monuments. Uh, Aman, uh, moving on to you, uh, now sort of touching upon the substantive provisions of, of the statute. Enormous mm. powers are given to the government to uh, declare sites and areas as sites of national importance in terms of ancient monuments, archaeological sites and remains. And consequently, once you declare these sites as sites of national importance, uh, they are protected areas. So what, what sort of legal regime is prescribed under the statute which, which deals with the, uh, this particular uh, empowerment? First of all, Hemant, my compliments on uh, taking this uh, new initiative, 75 laws that Thank shaped you. India. Thank you. And I'm sure uh, this will uh, throw some light to the, uh, to the uh, you know, contemporary generation Right. on which have been the landmark laws uh, which have evolved through this uh, journey of our independent India. Initially, the statute was enacted in 1901. Right. And in fact, all these three statutes were later on repealed and overridden by this particular 58 Act. Absolutely. And thereafter, as you know, Hemant, uh, there has been a, a very wide-ranging amendment in 2010. Right. So uh, the point that Vivekji was making with right. respect to the intervention and the interventionist role of the government in 58 right. was very apt and correct and thereafter it has been amended in 2010 Ten. to yes. you know uh, kind of neutralize uh, some of the aberrations which were happening there and whatever right. the experience uh, which uh, we could imbibe after 50 years of this journey right. the amendments were thereafter enacted right. now as far as the statutory regime is concerned we all know that uh, this parent statute after its amendment the Section 4 provides uh, for the central government. Right. They have the power to notify any area as an area of national importance, right. provided it fulfills the eligibility of you know, 100 years and a, uh, archaeological monument, etc., which has been laid right. down in Section 3. Right. So, uh, Section 4, the government has vast powers. However, uh, you know, they are also, uh, there are checks in this same very statute. And obviously, if there are any excesses, then the judiciary is also there. 
right. to step in and uh, you know intervene right. and there have been not one but several such instances now uh, there is a procedure which has been laid down in the statute hemant as you know right. that uh, notices are sent out uh, and uh, there is ample time which has been given under the act two months time for anybody Right. to file their objections right. and once the objections are filed they are considered a judicial order is passed, passed. if anybody is aggrieved by that then they have every right to move to uh, you know court of law right. and take that in appeal so therefore there is a robust system of uh, checks and balances in, in the terms statute. of judicial review uh, or uh, yes yes in terms of judicial review in terms of statute, statute also yeah. and with respect statute to also provides for uh, quasi judicial or judicial mechanism yes Is yes it? yes absolutely right. so the orders which are passed here are all in quasi judicial capacity as you I say see. and uh, therefore uh, there is a reasoned judgment which has to be given and it cannot be just a simpliciter you know, order, order or something absolutely like it's right. not like that which so th it has to be a reasoned order all parties have to be heard and thereafter uh, they have to put their submissions on record and thereafter a well reasoned comprehensive order has to be passed and usually in these cases, Hemant, as you are yourself a very eminent practicing lawyer and you are aware that most of these cases, right. they are put to judicial scrutiny before right. high courts and supreme court. Right. And in most of the instances, right. they have withstood the judicial scrutiny. Therefore, uh, it will also not be fair to say that they have been grossly misused. And uh, I, I believe that uh, the government today is also utilizing this uh, in the most apt right. cases. Right. And wherever there are any uh, uh, ambiguities or aberrations which are emerging, the government, uh, the Archaeological Survey of India and the uh, concerned ministry itself, they are taking uh, care of it at the appropriate level. Very, very, very well said. So I think, so, so therefore, there is centralization, no doubt about it. But at the same time, it comes with a system of checks and balances. Uh, I, would, uh, I would not say that, you know, this is excessive centralization or anything of that sort. Because this amendment also did not take place in tenure of the present government. Right. So uh, therefore, uh, I would not be respectfully agreeing with that argument of centralization. Yeah. But I would certainly say that... Uh, the uh, implementation of the statute, that is the most critical and important thing, which is what Vivek Ji was also flagging earlier. Absolutely. And I think the implementation is being done in a proper and a just manner. Right. And therefore, we have not seen any such uh, excesses being committed or any such glaring illustrations or examples being cited uh, all Absolutely. over the place. Absolutely. So, Vivek, picking up from where uh, you know Aman is leaving, uh, do you think that this regime, legal regime of declaring... Uh, assets as assets of national importance in terms of ancient monu mon monuments and archaeological sites. They are, in a way, contributing to the movement of protection and conservation of our heritage assets. Under the law, we are talking about monuments and archaeological sites. Right. But I want to quickly mention that heritage is much broader than that. Much broader than that, yes. There are intangibles also, and UNESCO yes. has recognized the Kumbh Mela also. Right, so right. I just Absolutely. Yes. like to mention that heritage is a much broader much concept. Much broader concept, yes. There are many countries in the world which are much more limited in I terms see. of their wealth of monuments and archaeological sites. Right, right, right. Which have managed to preserve them better. I see. How many monuments and archaeological sites would there be in India? No one has any idea because right. no one has counted. But right. if one were to take a guess, there will right. probably be about 100,000. Right. Right. At least 100,000, if not more. Right. How many have been declared as national under this so far since 58? Around 3,700. Right. What's happened to the others? Yes. Where right. are the others? Out of the 3,700 that have been identified, in an answer to parliament, the concerned minister said 24 are untraceable. Is it? Yes. That's alarming. So therefore, we need to ask a genuine right. question right. about what has been the positive fallout of this. Right. And is it the responsibility, I repeat, of the government alone? Amanji is absolutely right. There are penalties, there are this and that, but do we have the Any enforcement mechanism to enforce in place? It? There is no enforcement. Do we have mechanism. the infrastructure? Yes. Have we invested in maintenance? Yes. Have we invested in producing material on this? Yes. I am inclined to think the answer is more on the minus side than the plus side. Because, as I said, 
we assumed union government to do everything. Yes. And that is why I said yeah, we can't, this we, has we a very pass on dangerous, dangerous yes. mindset. That's, I, I think I agree. I agree with that. Well, let me acquaint you about the two nodal agencies relevant for this act. The Archaeological Survey of India, which is mainly responsible for conducting archaeological explorations and excavations, as well as maintenance of protected monuments and archaeological sites. Then there is the National Monuments Authority, which is primarily empowered to make recommendations to the central government regarding protected monuments and protected areas of national importance and to suggest measures for implementation of the provisions of this act. It is the key regulatory body under the act. Well, there is still much more to discuss with our guests and we will surely do that, but after a short break. So please don't go anywhere. Welcome back after the break. You're watching our special show on 75 years of legislative journey. Today we are discussing the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act, 1958. Let us also gather legal connotation of some of the key terms and expressions used under this act. Ancient monument means any structure, erection or monument, or any tumulus or place of interment, or any cave, rock sculpture, inscription or monolith, which is of historical, archaeological or artistic interest, and which have been in existence for not less than 100 years. While an archaeological site and remains signify any area which contains or is reasonably believed to contain ruins or relics of historical or archaeological importance which have been in existence for not less than 100 years. A protected area and protected monument shall mean any archaeological site, remains and ancient monument which are declared to be of national importance by or under this act. Aman, uh, returning back to the discussion and to the statutory provisions of this act, which we feel are significant for the viewers to know. There are a set of provisions which deal with acquisition of rights of private owners of protected monuments by the government. And then there is again another set of regime which deals with the preservation of such protected monuments. Can you tell in concise manner to our viewers what are these provisions are all about and, and how do they proceed? Now, uh, Hemant, as we discussed with respect to acquisition, uh, you just mentioned Section 2A, which is relevant, which defines, you know, these historical monuments or monuments of, uh, you know, national importance, uh, which uh, when they are declared, they become monuments of national importance. Right. Under Section uh, 4, the government has the power to notify any such uh, sites of uh, archaeological and historical importance as right. monuments of national importance. Section 3 are uh, the sites which stand already declared as sites of national importance for their archaeological value. Right. So this is the statutory re regime with respect to acquisition. Right. You were also pointing out acquisition with respect to some you know, private, private member owners. holding. So that is section 6 and 7, seven. is relevant there. Right. And there... Uh, the government or the concerned nodal authority can enter into agreements along with those uh, private, private uh, owners. landowners. And that depends on the contours and the parameters of the agreement as to what it stipulates. But obviously the maintenance uh, and the preservation and the protection is all handed out to ASI and I also see. happens in ages of uh, the uh, national uh, monuments. And therefore, there also the nodal agencies have the upper hand but obviously on paper, the ownership may still vest in that uh, private member. That depends on the understanding which has been arrived upon in the agreement. Preservation, obviously, as Vivekji was also saying, is, is all the mandate of the Archaeological Survey of India. Right. And uh, the guidelines, policy guidelines are uh, 
formulated and stipulated and uh, recommendations are given by expert designated bodies right. like uh, the National uh, Monuments Authority, etc. Right. And uh, therefore, there also the statutory scheme is absolutely clear. The preservation, protection lies at the, uh, in the remit, in the mandate of the Archaeological oh. Survey of India. Yes, yes. And uh, the National Monuments Authority is the expert designated body. Uh, Bibek, uh, there is another very significant uh, question which uh, has been at the back of my mind. Recently, uh, not too long ago, I mean, perhaps in July this year, UNESCO brought in two uh, properties, uh, heritage sites, into the list of world heritage sites. Uh, one was from Telangana and the other one from Gujarat. How does UNESCO arrive at this conclusion or, or decision or finding that these sites have to be brought into the list of World Heritage Sites. Since 1977, when India became part of this, there is a process of applying for UNESCO heritage status. It may not, right. be, it may not be just monuments and archaeological sites. The Jiling Hill Railway is also has that status. Right. There are two good things about this. First, just because you apply, you don't necessarily get it. Right. One of the good things about this is you have to have a governance structure in place right. for right. ensuring the preservation and maintenance. So right. because we are not doing what we should be doing in any case, right. there is an external danda. Right. Otherwise, the heritage status can be withdrawn. So this right. is a good thing of getting that. Right. Secondly, sometimes additional money begins to flow. Right. But the fundamental issue is if people become sensitized, and examples of that are Hampi and Manas, which are no longer on the endangered list. And this has primarily happened, notwithstanding the statute, because of the civic sense of responsibility, right. sabka prayas. Right. That, that's definitely a very uh, valid and reasonable uh, viewpoint. And, and people's participation is, is, is becoming all the more imperative because these sites are, are not... Uh, sites which are barricaded in a sense. These are public sites, you know, they're open for tourism and so on and so forth. Uh, Aman, coming on to you, very fundamental question. How does one balance conservation, preservation of these monuments and at the same time not lose sight of the development of infrastructure? Because many times we see the infrastructure, development of infrastructure gets uh, get, uh, uh, gets to face challenges, suffers, and uh, many a times we see encroachments happen, as Bibek was pointing out, uh, in, in the name of development of infrastructure. So how does one balance that? You're right, absolutely, Himan. That's a very critical question, that how do you balance the sustainable development and the preservation and protection of our archaeological and historical heritage? Uh, conservation and preservation of our histor historical heritage Right. cannot be the entire sole exclusive responsibility Literally. of the central government. Right. Each and every citizen, each and every authority has to come forward, participate and contribute in that respect. Right. So therefore, what Prime Minister has said is, uh, uh, is something which, uh, which has to be kept in mind and which perhaps should also reflect gradually uh, in the scheme because as, as on date today, with such you know, thousands and lakhs of monuments and our sites of historical heritage which are there, it right. is physically impossible that central government takes the onus of entire thing upon itself. So there needs to be implementation at ground uh, can, uh, cannot happen unless something, we have a statutory yeah. regime which is very pragmatic Absolutely. and uh, which leads to uh, participation of all stakeholders, right. all uh, citizens of the country. And therefore, right. that is the most uh, important thing uh, when it comes to... Uh, striking a balance between our historical heritage and sustainable and the, development. Well, it is time to take the viewer's question. This time, the question has come from Neha from Haryana. Let's listen. What is the punishment for undertaking construction in prohibited area or in regulated area without permission? Would you like to? Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's an important question. And uh, I would like to compliment the viewer who's asked this question. Now, uh, as far as... Uh, you know, uh, penalties for committing unauthorized construction, etc., or encroachment in the protected area. The penalty is being enhanced from 5,000 to 1 lakh. 
So yeah. that's a that's a you know major enhancement, so to speak. Secondly, it can lead to a jail term of up to two years. I see. Uh, so therefore, the punishment is very stringent for those who have committed such offences. Not only that. Right. The government, the designated government authority and officer who is responsible for protection and preservation of that site, uh, any omission on his part can lead to uh, imprisonment of three years I for see. that government officer. So right. it is extremely stringent for them. Right. It's in fact even harsher for them. Vivek, final word from you, with especially with regard to how does one improve upon this law now? Near Shillong in Meghalaya, there is a sacred grove. <coughs> right. Preserved, maintained. Right. Thankfully, it is not an archaeological site. Thankfully, it is not an ancient monument. Mm -hmm. Preserved by the local population because right. they have a sense of ownership. Near, on, near Bhopal, there is a famous Heliodorus column. The first archaeological pillar, first archaeological site where the name of Vasudev as Krishna, it's a Garur Dvaj pillar right. that's there. Right. It is a protected monument. monument. Does anyone know of its existence? No. no. Lack of awareness as well. Do the local population have a sense of ownership in it? No. No. So yeah. I've given you two diametrical examples Absolutely. of one. Where the, no, where the absence of the 1958 law works and right. another one where the presence of the 58 law does not work. This law is definitely good, but it needs to be revamped so as to address the changing needs of the society. On that note, we come to the conclusion of this episode. Thank you so much, Vivek and Aman, for giving you. deep insight into this law. And... That's all we have in this edition of the program. You can send in your feedback at sunsattv at sunsat.nic.in. You can also connect with us on various other social media platforms. Next week, we'll discuss the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Please send in your questions at sunsattv at sunsat.nic.in. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and good luck.